It was a, a tense time, and we were all watching the weather reports and uh, hoping that no hurricanes would come along the coast, because we do get a lot of them, you know, up in this area. At the same time, the engineers were hunting down the manpower and materials to strengthen the wind bracing at each of the 200 suspect connections. Le Measure designed H-shaped steel reinforcement plates, which would have to be welded in place while the building was unoccupied at night. We decided as long as we're fixing these things, we're going to make the connections so that this building will not fall down in a thousand year wind. And within a day, we had meetings with the people that had the capability of uh, mending this building and finding that there was steel available and so forth. Le Measure now realized that the unusual structural design of the building could be made to work to their advantage. The wonderful thing, you see, when we were designing the building with uh, Hugh Stubbins, Having a big ego myself, I loved my diagrams for these diagonal members. I would be very pleased to have them show on the surface of the building. But Hugh Stubbins put the kibosh on that from the beginning. No, no, no. This was a blessing in the end, because these joints were all therefore accessible. And the actual mobilization to get at them and fix them was relatively straightforward. The work was to be done at night and as secretly as possible, as soon as the office staff had left the building. I knew that all we had to do was strip off the gypsum board fireproofing and we could see these joints. The actual fix in most cases, it was very simple. It was a matter of getting some very thick steel plate, a very high stick, two inches thick, putting pieces on both sides of the steel diagonals uh, across the joint which was held together with the bolts. And within a day or two, the first connection started being put in place. We had between 21 and 23 welders working at a time, and on weekends we would have a few more. They worked every night and Saturday and Sunday. When you weld, particularly when you weld as much as we were welding, you produce a lot of smoke. You simply couldn't live on a floor that we were welding. And I think that the people living in the building would have become very upset if they understood exactly the dimensions of the problem. We had flown into New York, my wife and I, in a plane that had made available to us. It was a private plane. And uh, the pilot had to skirt some thunderstorms and ended up coming in close to Manhattan, and there was the building, sparkling. So by the time people actually started walking into the building, it was back clean and normal, and everybody was, was working again. No smell of welding, no one, no one except the uh, people who had been told understood exactly what was going on. Oh, I'd come back from a busy day, and my wife said, well, Bill, the New York Times has called, and they want to talk to you. And I said, oh, my god, I don't need that. Well, I mixed myself a martini and uh, finally dialed the phone at 6 o'clock. All of a sudden, I get an answering machine that said, the New York Times went on strike at 6 o'clock tonight, and it's closed for foreseeable future. Wow. Anyway, that was a great blessing. And all the newspapers in New York, it turned out, went on strike at that time. And stayed that way 
until October. If the newspapers hadn't been on strike, I dread to think what would have happened. It would have been, it would have been pure hell, I think. As the nightly welding continued, the building became progressively stronger. But on Friday, September the 1st, the weather watchers at the Rockefeller Center broke the news that everyone had been dreading. We had three different weather services giving us information every day on the approach of any kind of wind over 40 miles an hour. So we got the information that there was a storm coming up the Atlantic. And it was on a track that had the potential of coming straight up to New York. Okay, we figured right, that uh, the beginning of the uh, hurricane conditions will start there any time uh, after dark uh, this evening. Friday morning, we had an enormous meeting because there was, everybody was concerned. Uh, do we evacuate the neighborhoods? But uh, at the time we got into our meeting and uh, talked for an hour or two, by the, we got more word from the weather service. The storm has shifted path and is going out to sea. I guess when you have that many thousands of lives potentially at risk, you don't really have a choice. Um, you have to own up to it and do it. The unions cooperated. The uh, city cooperated. I always felt that Bill was heroic. It was just a pleasure to do. Sometimes, I guess, uh, emergencies make people behave better. And everybody did a wonderful job. There were, there were no bad guys. Everybody was wearing a white hat. My memory says that we did the whole job from the very start to the very end in eight weeks. And that we managed, and I know this is disputed, uh, eight to ten million dollars in that time. Now, it takes a lot of work from a standing start, no, uh, no preparation, to spend $10 million, $1978 in eight weeks. I don't think there was any blame. Not that I remember. There was no recriminations. There was um, some negotiations about who's gonna, who would pay for the damages. And I think LeMessure's insurance company paid a bit of money, and I don't know how much it was. We as architects didn't have to pay anything. And I always thought that Citicorp behaved in a very uh, professional and wonderful way about that. They didn't sue anybody. It was all handled by negotiation. There's been a, a whole evolution of standards and understanding of the wind that's gone on over the last 40 years. And, and one wonders, one wonders. I don't mean to speculate. I'm not going to pick any examples. But there might well be buildings that were built from the old days that have never yet been subjected to the wind that would knock them down. And they might go.